Um, Brad had been saying how important uh, the concept of duration is in it for Bergson and, you know, with regard to evolution in particular, and I'm still having a hard time figuring out, you know, what that means, but um, I haven't got very far. I started reading that article by uh, Pearson, Pearson um, and he sort of confirms that, that Bergson is, he says that Bergson is reacting primarily to Aristotle and Kant. Yeah, so I thought that was interesting, you know, Pearson, Pearson, Pearson whatever, agrees with that. The other thing that's more directly in the ta text is on what page is it? On one page, uh, there's a page where he talks about the purpose of, oh no, progress. On page 103, he says um, about two thirds down the page, in communicating itself, the impetus splits more and more. Life in proportion to its progress is scattered and so on. And I was wondering what the heck does he mean by progress? You know, because progress is a sort of word that, that, I mean, what that makes me think of is teleology, finality, which he explicitly rejects. And, and then over on page 114, um, this is the very beginning of the section called the plant and the animal. He says, this is the bottom, 114. Suppose, as we suggested in the preceding chapter, that at the root of life, there is an effort to engraft on to the necessity of physical forces the largest possible amount of indetermination. And I'm wondering if that is the, if that's what constitutes progress is maximizing indetermination maybe, or if that, because, you know, one of the things I've been, I've been trying to, he keeps suggesting he's going to tell us what this impetus is impeting what would be the word what this impetus is pushing toward and i'm wondering if that's what it is is it is does is that what the vital impetus does is try to maximize indetermination um and is that what he means by progress so i i mean i don't know i again i don't know if we have enough information to answer that yet maybe there's I, I, I thought the starting. That's, well, that's my, probably the, the most. On my copy, it's page 111, right before a break, where he talks about, he says, it's at the bottom of, of a paragraph that starts at the previous page. Um, Nevit, and, and I think you're right, though. He says, the role of life is to insert some indetermination in the matter. And in, in my copy, indetermination is italicized and then he goes on to say and that's why he's focusing on the nervous system he says a nervous system well here and then just below that he says more and more indeterminate also more and more free is the activity to which these forms serve as the vehicle and then he says the ner a nervous system is a veritable reservoir of indetermination and and then and then right after that break he says it must not be forgotten that the force which is evolving throughout the organized world is a limited force which always which is always seeking to transcend itself and always remains inadequate to the work it would fain produce but i, I thought that it was when he really started to talk about indeterminacy and then uh to, to talk about more of like you know animals moving the motion being extraordinarily important. Um, I thought that was, I don't know, I, it was very, I don't want to say it was easy to read, but it, it read faster for me than the earlier parts of this. Uh, the, this is kind of unrelated to this section, so I just wanted to get it out of the way so we can talk about this section and, and uh, move on. But there was just, I was listening to a podcast. I already told Hunter about this. So. But I was listening to this podcast uh, about uh, it was about time and kind of like about kind of how time has changed, especially with like the quarantine and all that stuff. But then kind of suddenly he went in to start talking about uh, genetics in relation to time. And uh, there's this guy, Sean B. Carroll, who wrote a book called uh, Something Forms Most Beautiful. I don't, I don't know exactly, but basically in it, he, he did some research uh, on these fruit flies in which he was like basically messing with certain genes that 
would like replace certain limbs in these fruit flies. Like for example, antennae would be like legs instead, or you, he could add like a, an extra set of wings or something to, to these fruit flies. And then he realized after they did more and more research that uh, humans and, and all animals kind of have these similar genes that are called like master builders. That's what they called them. That essentially uh, basically control other genes and decide and, and turn them on and turn them off, uh, basically, during the creation of, of certain limbs and, and uh, oh, oh, it's called a radio lab. Uh, I, I forgot what the, the title of it was. I can find it really, really fast. Give me a second. But um, basically, they were talking about, uh, you know, how, how they were like looking into these genes and they realized that, for example, like it's called uh, Dispatch 6 Strange Times. Uh, I'll, I'll put that in the chat. But uh, uh, basically, uh, they started talking more and more about these genes and it turns out that like, for example, giraffes and humans have the same master builder gene that builds their spinal cord. Um, so you would think that they would have the exact same spinal cord, but actually the, the only difference in the creation of those two uh, spinal cords was actually the duration of how long the gene was turned on. Uh, so they described it as a certain like rhythmic thing. So basically like for humans, uh, the spinal cord gene would, would go like on, off, but the giraffe one would last a lot longer. It would go more like on, off, you know? And so basically the only difference between those two genes was the duration that the gene was turned on. And so I was kind of immediately just thinking about obviously, you know, the fact that Bergson, even before DNA was discovered, thought about duration as this important thing. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't really know how that corresponds and I don't really have like a, a, a really strong uh, opinion about it, but it was just really interesting to me and it made me kind of want to read that book uh, to get more information on it. But uh, it was definitely, yeah. And, and so this section basically wasn't about duration at all. So <laughs> that's why I wanted to get out of, get that out now, but yeah. Well, but you, you talked about it being cyclical, but that the, for lack of a term, growth part for the giraffe went on longer you talked about it in terms of a longer period of time. So, I, I mean, I, I do think it's connected to duration. And this is not giraffes, but going back to human beings, anecdotal, but every single person I know who is taller than six foot two, they've all said the same thing to me, that they continue to grow in height, uh, even in college, that, that they continue to grow in height when they were you know, 16, 17, 18, even 19. And when you think about it, I think most, most people don't, that, that roughly, you know, 15, 16, there, there's a, just a stop to the height, but then for them, and that's where they said they gained their additional three inches in height. So there, there could be uh, a gene underneath the master builder <coughs> that for, for some people, the, the, the growth in height continues. This is just a quick comment, but I, um, given the importance of duration, and then, you know, if, if Ed and I are right about indetermination being a, such a big thing, um, I'm just guessing that those two have got to be deeply connected somehow. And I, I don't know how, I just kind of throw that out as maybe something we can keep an eye out for. I, I'd like to just before, um... I think that <clears throat> the indetermination that, that, that he's very um, explicit about, like in the, in the Dover edition on page 126, the very last page of the reading, uh, which is probably just for Ed, whatever the last page of the reading was for you. Um, he talks about indetermination as, literally he says indeterminate, i.e. unforeseeable, right? And Nevitt, I have had, plenty of conversations with you where I've said, well, we, we don't know what's going to happen. It's indeterminate. And you've made the point that it's not the same, that maybe there is still a predestined path, even if we can't see it. So it's that sort of indetermination. You know what I mean? I think that's, 
at least that's as far as he's been willing to go with the notion. I was very, very interested at the last part of the reading with this notion of indetermination. And uh, I actually had a, I had a question about, about that indetermination that I wanted to know if anybody could illuminate for me. And it was functional discontinuity. He argues at the very last part of the reading that, I remember you were talking at, uh, about nervous systems as reservoirs of indetermination. Right before that, he argues that uh, the elements that compose it are probably discontinuous at any rate, ever supposing they uh, anastomose, uh, anastomp, whatever, they exhibit a functional discontinuity. For each of them ends in a kind of crossroad where probably the nervous current may choose its course. And I was kind of stuck on this, this notion of like, first off, what is functional discontinuity? Because he never gets into it. And second off, what does he mean by choose? What does he mean by the, the nervous current choosing its path at these crossroads? And, uh, and until I, I guess, until I get that, I don't think I'm going to totally be on board with his notion that is indeterminate. What was your first question? You asked, what is functional what? Functional discontinuity. Uh, oh, you, you. I, think, I think Chase also. Yeah, so I've got at least a... Uh, I was thinking that... Joe, you can go. Okay, I was thinking when, from discontinuity, discontinuous, I was like kind of wondering what he was meaning by that, like in, at least in the Dover edition, going back to page 116 um, in the plant and animal section. He's talking about like the animal has a freer expenditure of discontinuous energy. Um, and so when I read functional discontinuity, I was kind of reading it as like with the development of the nervous system, we have the ability like to suspend the expenditure of energy and kind of like concentrate it into something else like later on. Um, like he talks about like the maintenance, like a plant is kind of just like taking energy in and just maintaining itself constantly. It doesn't have any like stop to its expenditure of energy. So it's just continuous. So it doesn't have a chance to like redistribute a concentrated amount, like into a different thing, like an explosive locomotive movement. Uh, at least that's how I was kind of reading it, but I did have like a question mark next to that. Cause when I first read it, I was like, what? Um, and I don't know what that word anastomos is. Is that a verb? Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's, yeah, I guess the crisscross roads, but. I think it's some kind of a noun, but yeah, so I think it's, uh, I can definitely get a kind of initial kind of image of what he's getting at by kind of comparing indetermination and also a kind of rhythm in a sense or, or duration in the sense that, so you know, his, uh, he seems to be putting a lot of emphasis on discontinuity in the same way that he talks about perception as a kind of selective act where you're actually kind of filtering out certain blocks of, of stimuli. And that's what actually gives you some kind of a, a discernment there that gives you the ability to actually perceive definite things in order to act on them. That's where, so perception is a kind of, uh, it's a way of kind of taking the stimuli and filtering it so that you have this kind of indetermination. And then the, those paths of the nervous system are basically, it's like you have the initial stimulation that hits you, but then instead of just a simple uh, input output where nothing has changed, the nervous system is a kind of way of taking that initial energy and giving it a kind of suspension where it can choose between different paths it crosses in a kind of, of node of the, the nervous system, the possible sensory motor kind of responses to whatever the stimuli is. So I see that as kind of, yeah, he, basically that kind of progress in a lot of ways is, you know, like he talks about, you know, the energy of the sun and how life has is basically a way of kind of trying to take that energy and use it in some degree. And where plants are generally going to have a, a more simple kind of, you know, just 
a fluid input output, animals are going to have that discontinuity that corresponds with being able to store it in their muscles. And he, he has this, you know, this long section about how exactly they do that, you know, using the, the glycogen system and all these things and, and muscles and whatnot. But I think what's going on there is that basically saying, you know, there's like this energy storage and the nervous system is a kind of specialization of this tendency that's always been inherent in life to kind of use that energy in a certain way that gives it, that kind of switches off the, switches off, it kind of uh, like twist up that duration. It adds some kind of variety to it or you can see it as duration or just any kind of energy that the sun say is a, at a kind of rhythm and life is a kind of way of taking that rhythm and kind of putting its own spin on it in a certain way. And that's where the, there's different tendencies to do that that correspond with the, the different branches, you know, of, of evolution and whatnot. So I, I kind of see how you can see in the sense of, you know, so if rhythm or duration is, you know, a, a kind of, it's taking a, a pattern and, and putting some kind of variety, a, a stamp to it, then I think you could see that here, but instead of just, you know, a literal, you know, sound, music, whatever, it's kind of doing it with, uh, with kind of these durations of energy by being able to store it and utilize it in different ways. And in this case, I think just inherently that tendency kind of leads towards a, the way of, of storing it and using it leads to a discontinuity or a switch in the rhythm, an indetermination that is kind of characteristic of life versus something that would be for um, inert matter, something like a rock, it's simply going to be that output input there's going to be very little of a change in that energy it's just simply going to reflect whatever is already there there's not really much variety or, or dynamic change going on in any way that it can kind of record that energy or record time into itself so yeah that's kind of my answer um when you were, I'll say something serious first and then send something that isn't serious, but I think still bears on what you said, Chase. And I wrote down something he wrote and I'm kicking myself. I didn't write down the page number, but I found a couple other things that are connected. He wrote each species, each species in the act by which it comes into being tends towards the tends towards that which is most expedient. And I, I thought that was interesting. And then on page 101, he does say at the top of at least my page, the living being leans naturally toward what is most convenient to it. And then he says in that, and that vegetables and animals have chosen two different kinds of convenience. And then, and then for a partial explanation of it, on 110, he said, a higher organism is essentially a sensor, a sensory motor system installed on, it, it, it implied like on top of systems of digestion, respiration, circulation. And he also repeatedly talked about movement. The ability of the organism to move seemed to be directly connected to the development of that organism making choices. Yeah, I know he like refers to consciousness being like proportional to the capacity for like free movement. Um, and at, at one point, I did think it was interesting. He said something like, uh, not that consciousness creates this function, but that this function intent or the consciousness, say the structure, um, intensifies the function. Um, getting at the idea that that function is still kind of present in and across like the lower developments of the line or different branches even. I found it at the, at the very bottom of 98, 
he says the humblest organism is conscious, conscious in proportion to its power to move freely. And in my edition, freely is italicized. Is consciousness here in relation to movement the effect or the cause? It's italicized in our version, which is uh, the Dover edition, it's 111. Oh, my, my, my 90, my 98 is 111? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, so I think this also kind of ties into one of the main things I was um, wondering um, was about this notion of, of tendencies that he, he stresses a lot where he's kind of saying that, and all this stuff is kind of uh, also the importance that he puts on divergence in evolution and dissociation and specialization in a sense where he he's saying you know this original impetus is just this thing it's just that it's originary at the beginning and then it kind of diverges and specializes itself into different tendencies but those tendencies were there to begin with in a kind of um blended multiplicity of a kind of virtual sort of superposition of these different potential tendencies or that if they are kind of stressed, then they became that main mode of, you know, the convenience of living that the main kind of uh, whatever trick that the organism had for, you know, taking that energy, storing it, and doing the whole thing of, you know, what makes life life. And I think it's interesting that he's, he ultimately kind of puts that into that, that development, you know, it started all these different divergent paths. I think he's saying that by the fact that, you know, you do have still these main lines of evolution and, you know, still some kind of like convergent aspects of evolution shows that, and that's where I think he gets this idea that there are actually some kind of, um, you know, main directions that are kind of inherent to evolution itself in a way. And I think the kind of the key to that is his whole idea he has of, of seeing the nervous system really, he does give it a kind of talos in itself to a certain degree in that it's kind of like a more complex, more specialized, uh, even higher form of this capacity to kind of inject indetermination and movement and consciousness into uh, basically the organism's intelligent response to, to these things. So I, I think this notion uh, of basically of tendency and differentiation and whatnot is, is really important to try to understand kind of his overall picture of what is going on here with evolution. And it, it ties in with this, uh, this notion he has of, you know, where does the evolution of consciousness exactly come in there? And then, you know, just from the perspective of, you know, like a philosophy of mind, He's got a, an idea of consciousness here, basically, that's showing that, you know, you can't really separate it from the question of life and of evolution itself. Because, you know, trying to ask, you know, if one thing is conscious or, or not, you're basically going to then have to try to look at it in a biological sense is what it seems to be saying to me. So those things are, yeah, are interesting. So I wanted to, uh, with regard to the... This is the regard to the div divergence and uh, dissociation that Chase mentioned and that, that Hunter asked about earlier. On page 117 in, in the Dover edition, which is maybe around one, 114 in Ed's, um, he says, he's talking about, is this a division of labor? And he says, not really. Wherever there is a division of labor, there is an association and also convergence of effort. 
Now, in the evolution we are speaking of is never achieved by association, but by dissociation. It never tends toward convergence, but toward divergence of effort. And so he seems to be saying this, you know, this natural impulse, his tendency is to sort of fracture. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the chapter, he used that analogy of the bombs, you know, a bomb breaks into a bunch of more little bombs that break into a bunch more and break. And uh, the picture that came to my mind is, um, you know, certain kinds of cracks in glass or ice, you know, you'll get this crack, these, these cracks and those cracks will ramify and ramify, and you just get this never ceasing, you know, tree of cracks. And, and it seems to be, you know, rather than things being associated, he said he thinks that impetus does that. One of the questions I had then is, well, then how do you get consistent, coherent, structures through evol evolution and you know chase said that ner the nervous system sounds teleological but what i'm wondering if instead of teleological you know he's used this term uh, canalization and uh, which i really didn't understand what it meant but you guys kind of explained it to me last time so now i'm thinking of it as like digging a trench and so that if you you know if you have certain tendencies that sort of reinforce each other in the sense of maximizing and determination, then you, you don't have to have necessarily a talos. You can have this impulse. It's kind of like, you know, like if you have that cracked windshield and one of those cracks happens to be in a region of glass that is, or ice that is weaker than the rest, that crack is gonna move much more rapidly than the other cracks. And then that's gonna get reinforced. And so I'm, I'm wondering if, if what happens is you get this, this canalization effect where one, once one of these trends maximizes an indeterminacy more than another, that tendency gets can, uh, uh, magnified. And then you get this sort of, as he says, a, a canalization that then becomes like the nervous system or the sensory apparatus. Um, anyway, so that was a thought. And then with regard, you know, this is, sorry, I just, but going back to the that passage that Hunter mentioned about the nervous current may choose its course. I mean, I find this notion of, of choose a bit troubling when he's talking about um, non-conscious things, although as Chase has said, that's probably not a, we gotta be careful about making, pretending like there's a clear distinction. But I wonder if at a rudimentary sense, in a rudimentary way, choice is at the most basic uh, level just tending toward more indeterminacy. And so like if if there's a tree of possibilities that some development could could go down, then it's if it was a purely mechanical process, it would be a random choice. You know, it would just do whatever it was going to do. But if there is some sort of impetus that favors indeterminacy, then the choice might be to, to go down the path that's going to maximize indeterminacy. So if, there, if there's a talos, it's, maybe it's indeterminacy, but it's not a talos in the sense of being out there. It's just, you know, as, as Chase was saying, it's, it's actually back here. It follows whatever path maximizes. I'm thinking of two distinct different analogies following on what you said, Nevitt. Uh, you know, people who study the brain talk about neural pathways, right? And people who have tried to help people who have been paralyzed from a stroke or anything, actually trying to, it's kind of like the, 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 the hand-mind connection, um, if, if they've been unable to use a hand. And, and what they realize when they, when they do scans afterwards, that literally different parts of the brain seem to be taking over from the other parts of the brain that were engaged before the accident or the stroke. And the second one, and, and, I, and I'm being very serious about this, even if it sounds very mundane, but if we talk about us going from place A to place B, think of the built environment, it wouldn't make sense unless you knew that if you had a map of the roads we were traveling on, right? So that the path we take to go from here to Wimberley is going to be different from the path of a bird flying from San Marcos to Wimberley. But we're, 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 we, we, but right, we're following roads because we're in an automobile. The bird doesn't have that constraint of pathways. Anyway, that's, that's, those two things just came to mind when you were talking. I was gonna just 
reinforce, I guess, Chase and Nevitt's like concern about because at least when he starts talking about the main line uh, or the uh, the true elementary tendency, that to me did sound like what determines like why and because it almost sounded like he was like favoring the human or of some sort, privileging the human. It's like what what is he getting at that? Um, and I guess my questions were kind of like how does he avoid yeah rendering that as a talos it is interesting the canalization point that you made never was helpful and about um like convenience kind of convenience of indetermination towards indetermination um and then like the whole time i was reading this chapter that was kind of like my issue of wondering like how is he going to avoid just kind of some sort of talk about the human being the privileged um species uh, in that secondary source you sent us Nevitt, i did give it a read and he does kind of like argue against that saying that like we can't understand bergson is saying this but at least to me kind of just says like that's not what he's saying he doesn't seem to give an argument as to why he's not saying that um then i guess that nervous system portion is kind of key to that where he talks about noting how the nervous system kind of rearranges and gets all the other tendencies kind of like to start supporting it um, it kind of takes charge as the dominant tendency starts emphasizing less the others as it becomes the, the dominant emphasis um yeah i guess so i'm wondering like because at one point he said something about like the, the the installing on was another phrase that stuck out to me i think you mentioned that ed where he says the nervous system installs itself on all the other ones um, and at one point, he says something about plants coming to be for animals. Um, and he, he talks about, like, if the explosion was initially made to explode, he's like, Anim plants need to be for animals or something. I don't remember. Oh, okay, this is on 116 of Dover. He says, but if from the very first in making the explosive, nature had for object the explosion, then it is the evolution of the animal rather than that of the vegetable that indicates on the whole the fundamental direction of life. Um, so some, that, those kind of phrases just kind of stuck out to me. You're just like, what's behind that? Um, don't, couldn't we say that there are other tendencies in the plant that are being emphasized that are just as fundamental, um, just part of those other tendencies that become de-emphasized in the animal? Um, and then I'm wondering, like, would he get to a point of saying something along the lines of, like, the animals being for the human, um, just because their nervous systems aren't as developed? But I don't know. Um, so that was kind of like just some questions I had throughout the chapter. Um, I, 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 what I'm going to try to do is find out why my pagination is, is different from Prestige's, and then have a code. So like there's six pages different or seven pages different. So I apologize. Um, but in, in terms of Joey's point, the, uh, it's on my uh, page 117. And at the very bottom of this page, there is, maybe this would help. It's footnote 59, if that's helpful. It's C on this subject, Shaler, the individual New York 1900. And it's the beginning of the first, uh, the beginning of the last paragraph of that page. It is unquestionably, for example, that success is the most general criterion of superiority. And then the beginning of the next sentence, by success must be understood an aptitude to develop in the most diverse environments through the greatest possible variety of obstacles so as to cover the widest possible extent of ground. So he might be a speciesist and thinks the human beings are at the top of the totem pole, food chain, whatever pyramid you, because he says a species would claim the entire earth for its domain is truly a dominating and consequently superior species, such as the human species. Yeah, I, um, Stephen Jay Gould, who I, I don't know, haven't read a lot of his stuff, but he was an evolutionary biologist, uh, wrote a lot of popular books, The Panda's Thumb, and was that the name of that book? Anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, but he, Stephen Jay Gould, discusses this issue of whether our conception of nature is extremely anthropomorphic, especially when we say that humanity is the pinnacle of evolution. 
because he says when you generally when people say that they're choosing they're they're just implicitly assume it's they're sort of begging the question they're implicitly assuming that whatever humanity's most developed faculties are are obviously superior and so then if you go back and say well then where, what was evolution you know where, where were the where was the dominant trend well it was the one that ended up in humanity but he said if you take a criterion and i can't remember the exact details but if if you rather than having a anthropomorphic criterion if you say just pick something for example covered the the widest face of the surface of the earth and i think then i think ants win maybe in that case and then if you choose the criterion has the greatest mass like literally you know physical mass i think bacteria win and so you know that question that joey and ed bring up i i have that too i mean if he he says that the impulse of life is to maximize indetermination and if you choose that as a criterion then it does seem like you could make a case that uh that human beings are homo sapien has max is the you know has the maximum ability to do that but then you then i wonder you know is stephen jay gould's critique here does that come in and say well it's because you chose a criterion that was that was going to already come out with that conclusion you've sort of begged the question and so at one point i do not know where i would find where he says this but he says something about like we could consider the plant species more, but like, that's obviously not of our concerns. So let's turn towards, you know, the animal kingdom. Um, and he almost like that kind of comment almost implied that like, there are considerations of like dominant tendencies that we don't have that plants could have um, along that line. But he, he kind of made it sound like, why would we consider those? That's not, it's not in the scope of this project. We want to consider like, what, what is the human's place in relation to the animal kingdom in relation to the world? Um, so, Maybe he's not necessarily a speciesist, but he wants to just focus on the human. I'm trying to give him some credit here. <laughs> um, yeah, well, he I think have a bias for animals over plants. Well, well, it's my understanding that I think he's kind of trying to relate the experience that we have, humans have to evolution. And so he's not, I don't think he's necessarily saying that humans are more evolved, but it's just my understanding that he wants to kind of sort of make a connection between our experience, uh, our, our kind of strife or, or our natural striving towards like convenience and, and idleness, but also the fact that that builds like a certain anxiety and, and, and stress within us because, you know, we kind of want to explode on some level. These, these potential energy builds in us and we want to be able to explode, but we also kind of seek out the freedom of being able to choose not to explode. Uh, so I, from my understanding, I just feel like it's not that the plant isn't as important, but that with like to, to try and understand the plant would be to try and uh, like understand unconsciousness, you know, to, and, and we don't understand that. So let's just for a second, think about consciousness, think about our experience and look at the plant or look at the animal in terms of that. Yeah, so I think one way to, to kind of understand maybe um, what Bergson is, is arguing is to think um, that he, so he talks about, you know, these different sort of directions and i'm thinking here of you know in the last chapter he talks about the what is it the pens or whatnot and how you have a kind of movement that can get through them until it basically exhausts itself and it seems like he he wants to say that evolution that what's kind of special about it is that it its ability to create variety, to to have a kind of, you know, multifariousness to it, and also a kind of dynamism in the sense of, and that's also where that ties in with that indetermination. And I think he sees the, so he talks a lot about the, 
how plants are kind of, you know, they found a way to get their energy by remaining stationary. And I think he says basically that because they were essentially stationary because of that, they didn't really need to do anything else kind of, you know, extreme beyond that, except when they did, you know, when their conditions were bad, say, then they kind of reverted back to these tendencies that are more like animal forms. Like he mentions the, uh, basically, I think it's like what the a Venus flytrap would be basically the, the plants that have some kind of animal qualities and whatnot. And it's basically what that kind of leads me to believe is that he's saying basically that the kind of the, the greatest movement of complexity and dynamism in these things is going to be towards the, the movement of animals because vegetables and uh, he mentions even, you know, the, the parasitic animals is kind of like dead ends because they remain at this fixed state. And he talks about uh, fungi as kind of the same thing for the for plants that they're kind of like this dead end that didn't really advance because it basically was like okay we're fine here we're we don't have any reason to kind of go beyond where we're at at this current state therefore it becomes a kind of fixed dead end that is just kind of there that doesn't kind of continue uh diverging and complexifying itself and whatnot so i think he's going to see um I don't know, it's kind of, this may be like paradoxical because I kind of see it as, you know, going back to like the pin analogy or whatever, it's kind of the, where you get the least resistance, I think, is where you get like the biggest, you know, movement of the impetus. But it seems like it's almost like because animals had to strive more, then they therefore had to kind of complexify more and create, you know, just the, these crazy, uh, different ways of adapting based off, you know, uh, like the accidents in the road is the, the other sort of analogy he uses is that basically, you know, there's like the movement and then there's like the adaptations in that. It, it seems like humans complexified because they had so many different kind of barriers that made them have to like bring out this animal aspect and with that some kind of greater complexity and dynamism to get these novel forms uh, of uh, trying to find a convenience to live. So it seems like maybe that's one way of kind of seeing how he, he puts uh, kind of like animal life and specifically even humans as being, you know, that we have this uh, very complex nervous system kind of somewhat, I, I don't think so. Basically, I said earlier, you know, as a, a Talos, but I would, I would use that word in a very special, selective manner with a, a grain of salt. You know, I do think he, he says in here basically that, you know, humans are basically at like the cutting edge of this line of evolution in a sense. But with that, I, I definitely think he, he still has – he would say there's something kind of special still reserved for, for plants that they're, you know, they're not totally static. I think maybe they're just like relatively more static. And that's why he kind of puts the, the more dynamic kind of more creative, more variety of the animals at a kind of a, a step above that in some sense. I was, I, I don't recall that, I don't think he's talked about thermodynamics yet. I, I don't remember, but I, you know, I, I was thinking maybe you could make a sort of thermodynamic argument um, that would be connected to his notion of mechanism. So, you know, if you, the second law of thermodynamics says that uh, closed systems tend toward maximum entropy. So, you know, they tend toward disorder, collapse, falling apart, and so on. Um, and so this, you know, systems just, that's what happens. And life seems to be in opposition to that. Um, you know, the way I've, I've thought about it in terms of mechanism is if you 
pour enough energy into one of these closed systems like the sun on the earth, then that energy will, will cause that matter to spontaneously self-organize into local regions that seem to violate the law of entropy, but they don't, you know, over the, over the whole system. It's just that you have the, this energy poured in and you get these complex systems built up. And maybe one way of thinking of what Bergson is say, saying is that, yeah, but you need something to explain that. I mean, just to say that matter just does that, doesn't really tell you anything. And so maybe, uh, you know, it, so what, what I'm trying to say is maybe, maybe if you think about the way, the way he's trying to explain life, why is it that you have systems, namely living systems, that seem to move in an opposite direction from entropy? They move towards self-organization rather than disorganization. And, and in fact, and if you look at purely mechanical systems, they don't do that. Of course, I, you know, I guess he said there is no purely mechanical systems, it's on a continuum. But if you look at systems that are closer to lacking life, like just piles of rocks or something, you don't see that sort of self-organizing uh, process. And so I guess what I'm trying to say, maybe, I mean, you know, if maybe, if, maybe this is still anthropomorphic, but maybe it's a way of trying to, trying to justify that by saying, you do see in, in the physical world, in physics, these two tendencies. One is toward disorganization and collapse and pure mechanism. And the other is this movement that, that seems, as he says, the vital impulse does, that seems to move in the opposite direction that tends to produce greater complexity, self-organization, self self-reproduction. And, and then in, by that criterion, it does seem that at least in, on this planet, that human beings seem to represent the maximum of that of that of that process. Yeah, yeah. When you when you Nevit, that's a good point. When you uh, it's it's the page after the page that has footnote sixty in it. He 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 really starts talking about instinct and intelligence, and is trying to explain what those two things are, and then what are the relationships of them to each other. And it seems to me that that he's he's putting a sum on the scale on behalf of intelligence as as you know an indication of of uh, <laughs> of higher higher in the evolutionary process. And then remember, he says on I, it, it's it's uh, on the page that has footnote number sixty one. Uh, and he puts this in um, italic. In my edition, it's italicized. It, he says we should not. He says uh, we should say not Homo sapiens, but Homo faber. That's man, the maker. In short, intelligence considered in what seems to be its original feature is the faculty of manufacturing artificial objects especially tools to make tools and of indefinitely varying the manufacturer. So I'm trying to find some stuff in, so I have this book or I got it from the library. Um, Bergson complexity and creative emergence. And it talks a lot about systems theory and complexity and um, thermodynamics, non-equilibrium, dissipative systems, all that stuff. I haven't read it. So I'm basically trying to, to select parts of it just within like a minute that are interesting. It's all kind of confusing to me. I see a bunch of like chemical names that, that hurt my brain, but I think there's definitely it could be something said to that in the sense that, you know, if he, he's saying that the life, one of the, the main tendencies of life is this kind of like, situation process that it kind of self as, as kind of center of indetermination. Can you guys hear me now? Did I cut out? 
Okay, so you, know. you, you cut out, but we can hear you now. Okay, so basically, he talks about indetermination as a as a kind of tendency of life, and you can see that as a or um, individuation, individuation as a kind of indeterminacy, and that it's kind of trying to introduce some kind of a gap between you know the rest of the world and itself as something that can act in different ways upon the world and i could see where that would tie in with this whole idea of systems of like self-organizing systems in that you know so he talks about the whole as a the, kind of this big thing but in a way like a self-organized system is trying to kind of create even if it's not a, a total you know whole in of itself a kind of relative degree of of freedom in a sense that's kind of based off its self-organization and its ability to kind of create that gap between these things so i don't know if i'm explaining this very well but i, I can see this kind of connection between like a, a self-organizing system and also kind of this development of indetermination from you know the stimuli of the external world and then this ability to kind of act upon it in different ways so yeah that, that's what i i can see in that but i don't really know enough about thermodynamics and uh systems theory in order to really tie it in but it, it seems like a promising topic and i've got this whole book on it basically that i just have not had time to read so yeah um i guess maybe i'm maybe i'm kind of uh looking at his definition of life in a naive way i mean i guess certainly so once again as i tend to always feel but uh despite that i have this this notion of his his understanding of life or of the the origins of life the more simple sort of definition of life at a, at a microscopic level for him as being uh, and he talked about this on, on page in the dover edition talked about this on page 114 talked about this on 114 when he's describing life as an effort to give necessary physical forces the largest possible amount of indetermination and how this effort cannot result in the creation of energy or if it does the quantity created does not belong to the order of magnitude apprehended by our senses and instruments or measurement our experience and science yada 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 the point he's making for me there and this this I feel is I'm I want to argue against this notion that he's like being necessarily anthropomorphic and necessarily biased in service of, of humanity and you know the, uh, we we great indomitable Homo sapiens yeah <laughs> you know I feel I don't know if he's doing that and the only reason I say that is because right here he talks about life as giving these necessary physical forces in indeterminacy. And the way he describes it as doing this is, and I, I just thought of this in, the, in terms of like amoebas, as drawing in potential energy and then releasing that same energy in what he calls an explosion. And that is just the tendency that he has seen as, as the unique thing that living protoplasm seems to do compared to other uh, non non or inert matter in its environment so the first and he talked about this on page 116 he goes further and he says that uh the first organisms talks about first organisms drawing energy from the sun and releasing that energy from the sun in locomotion so he talks about the first organisms as having a twofold existence and that is that they draw in energy from the sun and then they shoot it out in some sort of locomotive explosion and i think of a, like a cell you know using its weird little like arm things to swallow a piece of food of some kind in a, a bacterium or something and so very very simple very, very but he says by nature these two tendencies to take in energy and to shoot out energy in an explosion are opposed just by definition just by by nature and he says that vegetable matter or, or the plant kingdom happened to find great success in sitting there absorbing matter and or absorbing the energy. And it didn't need to, do, it was convenient. And so I think he's giving plants 
good credit, you know, in saying that, and this is just a tendency. This is where he's talking about tendencies. It's not that all plants do this. Some plants can move and some plants are in some sense sensing things like that and they can eat bugs and whatever. But he says that the overwhelming majority of vegetable matter of plants has a tendency to store energy as the first step in the process. And you have to store energy to get to step two, which is releasing energy. And so I think the only point, he's, I think he's making a very modest point here. And it's that animals or animal life tends to release that energy that it has stored up in these flares, in these, in these explosions. And, and therefore, according to this logic, the animal evolution is the next step in the movement of life of storing energy and shooting it out i think that that's that's i think his only basis for saying that that animals are necessarily the next step i think it's just it's just talking about it like like as a terrain of, of rational thinking i don't think he's saying like like you know humans should inherit the earth you know or some sort of claim like that i, I don't think and in fact i think even then going further later on when he's talking about higher organisms it sounds kind of like he, he's almost getting a little ironic when he's talking about a higher organism is just a nervous system that's been installed in a protective jelly body that's delivering it glycogen all day so that it can it can uh, create a complementary system of organs and, and serve a, a, the master of the nervous system that's piloting this this suit that keeps it safe that's all a higher organism is. That, that's, you know, I don't know. That's what I got out of it. Maybe, again, being naive, but I don't know. Um, I, I didn't, I noticed Madeline had her mic off. I don't know if she, if you wanted to say something, Madeline, before I ranted on it. <laughs> I think she's had her mic off um, for okay. a while. All right. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to say, yeah, like, I think I agree with you, Hunter, about where you're going. Um, I guess the, the accusation still somewhat seems uh, sensical to me that, like, he's the one who sets up the criteria um, that would eventually come to privilege the human. I guess that's still, but then I guess the, uh, may, maybe are you saying something along the lines of, like, we still observe this in all of life, that there's a tendency that is emphasized is privileged in all these organisms and just happens to be most highly developed in the human um yeah and then the, a certain the point tendencies of privileges in the plant world are just you know not of not a focus for him well it's, he talks about i mean i think that it's just yeah yeah i think i agree with you sorry i, I thought you were done in the middle of your sentence but um i i think that he is He's just saying that, like, I, and in fact, I mean, I guess he is kind of taking it. He's taking it a little far by saying that that energy stored up, then in its release, is sort of a next step. I guess rather than just saying it's a another thing that happens to energy sometimes i guess he would say it's a next step based on the fact that it creates more indetermination it allows for that so it's like that that idea of indetermination that he sets up is what allows him to kind of give it an idea of, of progress i guess towards the human or not necessarily mm -hmm. towards the human but that the human just happens to be farthest along and i think that that differentiation is important that it's contingent it's not that like evolution was building up to the human it's just that the human by chance and accident and through some sort of internal life impetus happened to be the one that was most highly developed. Um, Actually, at least that, and I'm this? seeing that too in this, in this little article that research sent us where he does mention like, we shouldn't understand Bergson as saying that everything's been for the sake of the human. It's just that um, the human kind of, the human could have been different and it just happened to be more interesting, more emancipated quote unquote than the others. I actually had a question for you, Joey. Didn't you say the contingency could help him out of the telos problem? You were saying that, that like the notion of contingency could kind of... Yeah, yeah. It's that just like, it's kind of through accidents um, that evolution led to the human being more interesting. 
um, as opposed to like, if it was a Talos, then it would kind of be necessary. This is where nature's going. Nature had a plan, you know, the kind of uh, the finalism that he doesn't want to subscribe to. He doesn't want to say that the human has always been in the object, that, that the human's always been nature's object. It's just that by happenstance that we ended up with a human that was very interesting according to what Bergson wants to say is nature's um, tendency, primal tendency. If, if we go before there, and I will, I will, if I have to, I'll just buy the Dover edition and then send you on an email the quotations from then the correct pages. But in the page I have that has a footnote 60 in it, but again, I guess footnote numbers are different. Do you remember the place where he says vegetative torpor, instinct and intelligence? These are the elements that coincided in the vital impulsion common to plants and animals. And then in italicis, talis, talicized words, the cardinal error which from Aristotle onwards has vitiated most of the philosophy of nature is to see in vegetative, instinctive, and rational life three successive degrees of the development of one in the same tendency, whereas they are three divergent directions of an activity that has split up as it grew. The difference between them is not a difference of intensity, no more generally of degree, but of kind. So what I'm reading there is that these are distinct ways that organisms, that living things uh, are able to function in their environments. And in, and in fairness, at the same time, which makes it sound like I might be saying that Bergson is saying, aren't, uh, aren't human beings wonderful? There's been more and more work done on birds. And there was a fascinating documentary on, I believe it was Nova, just in, during this last month, where people have constructed very intricate experiments and there was a species of bird who was able to recognize that it, 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 the stick that it had would not reach a morsel of food, but by dropping stones, three stones, rocks, then a platform would tilt and then a larger stick would, would roll out which then the, it brought that stick over to the other. I mean, it was fascinating to watch this bird. And it's like, wait a second, he, he is, or she, I don't, don't know the gender. But anyway, what I'm saying is if, and, and then people have studied birds in New Zealand and they've realized they've actually showed that the birds have altered the sticks to make them into different tools for different purposes. And so if Bergson is right that it's, it's something about uh, Homo Faber, a man the maker, if other animals have the capacity to alter their environment and to make tools. In fact, I, uh, Nevit, I'm old enough, you may remember, I could have sworn that people were arguing this like when we were in college about, you know, man the tool maker, right? That the hand is the cutting edge to the yeah. mind and, and all that. So it just reminded me of, of what seems to have gone away but, but um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I just thought those two distinct points were interesting. Oh, well, I feel like wouldn't that speak to his point about these tendencies being available, like in all of life and that maybe man, Homo Faber is really just the one in which it's most emphasized in. And it's become a very dominant way for us to create indetermination. Yeah, I think it's a, uh... So he says, you know, uh, so he, he criticizes Aristotle for saying that it's all one path kind of then leading to the human and it's supposed rationality, which I don't know if you look at the world, I don't think humans are very rational really. But um, so he's saying, no, it said there's, there's different divergent directions. However, all these tendencies we because we all have that original impetus which was like the original you know virtual multiplicity of all the tendencies by being that thing that you know that hunter pointed out the the first organisms being that storing of energy then the explosion of it and he says kind of you know the first organisms are probably this basically a, a mix of of plant and animal tendencies 
kind of together. And then they differentiated from that. But he, like he says, you know, uh, many times is that all the animals, they still have that ten, the tendencies of the plants laden within them. And uh, the same, you know, and vice versa, of course, the plants have animal tendencies laden within them because they probably came from, you know, this original ancestor that had all of them kind of diffused within it. And it also had basically what eventually became a nervous system and a, a specialized, you know, the vertebrates was diffused within that original organism. So I think what he's kind of saying here is that, yeah, I think uh, the point that Joey made about, you know, contingency is very important in showing that he, that he does not believe, you know, that, that the human is a teleological goal of all these things that basically life goes on doing this thing of basically kind of coming up with ways of basically storing energy and releasing it in all these different creative ways that are in some sense kind of responding to their environment but are also a kind of uh, something more kind of creative and coming out of its own sort of just expansive energy to be able to to have different forms of being able to to do these things but that it just happened to be that uh we developed along this line that led to the human that is the best known example of this ability to really have this kind of gap of indetermination from the stimuli of the external world and to have kind of multiple pathways within its nervous system for being able to to choose how to use that energy because it can it can store that energy you know in the muscles and, and also it has the greatest kind of capacity for mobility also but uh, i wonder if um so to, actually to kind of argue for kind of uh anthropocentric you know tendency of that definition is I've always thought that animals, um, you know, maybe this, maybe this is kind of a non sequitur, but if, if you think in terms of intelligence, I think it's always helpful to think of intelligence in multiple ways where every animal is a kind of specialization of their own intelligence that, that is basically how they live. You know, you know, my cat or, or Nevitt's cat sleeping back there, they're, they have an intelligence that is basically, you know, they know what is going on in a very sensory level. You know, they have everything mapped out in this way that we don't understand at all. Like, I don't know what the, the smell of, like, the back of my closet is at all. That, that means nothing to me. But humans have, not humans, cats have a kind of intelligent way of knowing these things that is kind of their specialization of their kind of mode of, you know, taking in stimuli, kind of discerning information and then using it to act on the world. So I've always kind of seen that all animals have kind of their specialized form of intelligence and, you know, the human kind of capacity for that isn't necessarily better than another one but so yeah i've but i i see what he's trying to get here and i see that it's kind of it's it's a good way of being able to kind of make differentiations in terms of you know the long-term evolution things like that but then i think it also helped to kind of balance that out by uh kind of decentering the the you know, specious privilege of humans and whatnot. But yeah, that's just kind of my, my take on that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm reading, I'm, I'm going to kind of jump across a bunch of different passages. So forgive me if you guys can't find them. But I think on page 114, he says in, in the italics at the end of the break, it says the same impetus that has led to the animal to give itself nerves and nerve centers must have ended in the plant in the chlorophyllian fun function which makes me think that on some level he thinks that plants have ended evolution or or at least have have 
don't have the same problem that humans have, I suppose. And, and that, what, what I think of is kind of going off the, the, the glass, like something, a rock or something hitting the glass and it breaking apart. And we imagine one of those lines breaking off from the center being both plants and animals or like an ancestor that both plants and animals had. And they were, they were moving down this impetus, down this line, this crack or whatever. Uh, and that impetus is storing and releasing energy. And so at a certain point, plants and animals kind of break off from this, this single crack into two different, uh, two different cracks. And, and the, the plant towards storing energy and the animal towards releasing energy. And they're both going in the same direction. They both still have this, this impetus that's pushing them forward. But I imagine that the plant kind of, the crack ends, or, or maybe it, 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 it's, it's not as long as the, the animal. It kind of ends at a certain point. And he, he even makes a point, he says, uh, on page 118, he says, among the divergent developments to which it gives rise, some go on indefinitely, others come more or less quickly to the end of their tether. These latter do not issue directly from the primitive tendency, but from one of the elements into which it has divided. So the primitive impetus hasn't stopped, but one of the, the kind of cracks coming from it has reached an end. The problem with the animal, is, what I see in this kind of imaginary crack thing is that uh, it, it's going off and then maybe like some of the cracks are kind of going back towards the center. Uh, like the specialized kind of, the more specialized it's getting and the more the, the kind of goals kind of distance itself from the impetus, then it starts kind of going back, back away from the impetus and, and kind of contradicting the impetus in some way. But it's coming still from the impetus and, and it, it's still like a part of that, but at a certain point, and, and then in 119, he has another italics, he says, when a tendency splits up in the course of its development, each of the special tendencies which thus arrive tries to preserve and develop everything in the primitive tendency that is not incompatible with the work for which it is specialized. So certain, you know, the tendency is splitting up and, and all these genes or, or kind of genetic things that, that preserve that specialty and also kind of work in the impetus are preserved and continued and, and, and pushed forward. So I think the question that, that I am, am asking is, is what, what happens when those kind of things contradict? You know, what, what happens when there isn't a quality that can preserve both the impetus and the, uh, the, the specialty that, that, that's moving forward? My impression is be contradicting to the impetus. Uh, like, uh, did you read the passage when a tendency splits up in the course of its development, each of its special tendencies, which thus arise, tries to preserve and develop everything in the primitive tendency that is not incompatible with the work for which it is special. It, could you your your microphone is kind of. This special tendency is always going to be compatible with, say, the, the impetus, but then there's um, like different tendencies or derivative tendencies that kind of develop that can support that. But like if they become incompatible, then they'll be dropped. That was really hard to hear. I think your microphone like partially shut off or something. It's kind of what it sounds like. Uh, it sounds like Joe, if I got it right, Joey was saying that those things that become into incompatible become one of those, I forgot what term you use, but basically a dead end. But, but yeah, uh, but Travis I, seemed I, to be saying something different. I, I think that the whole is still stored in that, right? So that all the dead ends that, that are reached are still connected to this, this impetus in the center. And, and so they're not they're not gone, they're just not being currently expressed. So they can still be utilized and kind of push back in, in certain directions and, and, you know, maybe contradict, but also go back in towards the impetus because they're, they're still stored, you know, in, in kind of these genes that are not necessarily being utilized, but still exist. So I, I think that there's still room for, for those things that aren't necessarily being used, but still exist. And so, despite those contradictions, there's still an opportunity to kind of, for that crack to, to, 
to turn around or, or, or to develop in a different way. Uh, but the, there are dead ends that are maybe going against the impetus. So, uh, you know, the first thing that that reminds me of is his, uh, when he talks about duration and how duration is the accumulation, in a sense, of sort of the accumulation of the entire past. And so the growing edge of duration somehow incorporates everything that's gone before. And so maybe those two are related. But then I guess, so I'm, I'm asking, I think I'm just trying to figure out what you mean. So you're saying based on that italics that there may be uh, one of these dead ends, but that because you have this accumulation of tendency, it's always possible that that dead end may actually start start and start moving again. Is that the the kind? Is that what you're suggesting, Travis? Or, or that from that dead end, like another crack could come. Like like those those dead ends maybe end. You know, like in the example for the plants, that that might end, but something still could possibly come out of that. And and so like there are a bunch of dead ends, but they all kind of have in their duration in those cracks. There's an infinite number of places that you could kind of come out and, and, and exit from and continue, so. So I, I don't want to sound too silly, but just, <laughs> you know, so, uh, like wacky B-movie science fiction, but, um, you know, just to use a, a wacky illustration, so maybe, you know, you could have a plant that, you know, it's, that's the dead end, but then some, uh, and I don't at all mean to be uh, denigrating what you're saying. I'm just, I, I'm just trying to think of an illustration that maybe you could actually have a plant begin to move towards something like intelligence or something like that. So uh, you have this sort of stasis, but then it, it also has all those potentials. So maybe plants could start off in another direction that would then make it a, a more effective agent of indetermination, something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Like, like, like the chlorophyllian function is kind of an offset of that impetus, but that plants, you know, as a whole could grow off from that chlorophyllian function and develop beyond that and into a different crack. But that, that function or that tendency towards a certain function is a single crack and that that can build into infinite other cracks. And, and so to understand plants, we have to understand the point in which that like the original impetus was broken off from and all the cracks that could have came from that, which could end up back at the animals eventually, you know, like the, if they start wanting to release energy more, they could end up back as animals. And that's why there, there are certain plants that are more kind of apt towards, uh, you know, movement. So um, I'm going to try to reiterate, I, I think kind of just a be sure that I'm kind of understanding. So, so you're kind of saying that these dead ends may not necessarily be straightforward dead ends because basically what their kind of specialty was that just happened to lead towards a dead end is still kind of present as a tendency, though in a more undifferentiated, less specialized state and previous forms of evolution um, that they diverged from and that those paths can then lead to other branches that are more fruitful i guess and lead towards a bunch of differentiations in themselves and so it's basically because of that original impetus that was that had all these undivided i mean undifferentiated tendencies that therefore you can get these dead ends that may in themselves be dead ends, but basically what their specialization is may actually be fruitful for other paths of, uh, of evolution. Is that correct or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, what, so no, go ahead, Chase, sorry. All right, I was just gonna say that then, yeah, I think this, it's interesting to kind of compare that to uh, his notion of duration and especially um, memory because, uh, because I kind of wonder exactly, he seems to have almost like a, like a more or less straightforward correspondence where it's basically, you know, that original impetus is basically kind of like this act of duration that works through. And then all these, like these ideas about these tendencies that kind of like are stored up. That's kind of like his notion of like, you know, the virtual memory that's always like present. And 
I wonder if I, I'm just like wrong about that or if that's kind of what he's saying, which, which leads to, you know, so is he, is he saying there is a kind of, um, kind of a real organic, like shared memory to a certain degree that's, that, and maybe that's kind of like what, what genes are in a certain sense. I don't know. I'm kind of just speculating there, but yeah. I don't understand what he, uh, his understanding of memory at all. I don't know, Joe, I, Joey, you read that book. Did you, did you gather any, because he does seem to think that memory is not purely organic and that, you know, like, it's not merely storage, of, like, for example, in neural tissue, that it, there's something more to it, but I don't really understand what. Yeah, I know he has a real, he does make, like, a pretty strict, differentiation between matter and memory which you know the way that he also does kind of have a divide although it's not uh you know super strict between uh say life as or organized matter versus inert matter i wonder if therefore there's kind of a a similarity there because he seems to have these similarities between basically like his notion of duration and even kind of the original impetus of evolution itself, that they're kind of, kind of, uh, that the original impetus is really kind of like duration, but in the field of life or biology or, or I guess organization of matter or something like that. I'm not sure exactly, but I don't know. Maybe something to look for in the, in the future. Um. I, th I'm not going to be able to answer the memory question, uh, but I, we're getting closer to the end, and I wanted to bring up uh, an observation he made, and that was it's italicized, and if someone has figured out um, the pagination uh, relationship, uh, for me it's on page 123, uh, about halfway down the page, he said... Uh, he says, thus, if we consider only those typical cases in which the complete triumph of intelligence and of instinct is seen, we find this essential difference between them, colon, instinct perfected is a faculty of using and even of constructing organized instruments. Intelligence perfected is the faculty of making and using unorganized instruments. So what I was getting there from him was that um, I apologize for saying true creativity because I probably wouldn't be able to fashion sticks to be able to do things that the birds are doing. But it, to me, what he was implying was what we mean by the term invention, that instinct can permit certain animals to modify things that they see, material objects, where human beings can imagine something that has never existed before and make it. But that's, that's just my reading of it. So I couldn't find the, the page, but I kind of looked ahead a little bit because I, I thought maybe you had uh, gone ahead somewhat and I found this, uh, I think this quote kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier with, um, you know, in terms of duration and rhythm and, and all these things. So on 128 of the Dover edition, the beginning of that paragraph right at the top says, the profound cause of this discordance, which I'm not sure exactly what the discordance he's talking about is, lies in an irredeemable difference of rhythm. Life in general is mobility itself. Particular manifestations of life accept this mobility reluctantly and constantly lag behind. So it seems like that's pretty important there to understanding, you know, what he's going on with, with, uh, with life, with evolution, that he is saying basically that this idea of like a difference in rhythm connected with mobility is pretty important. Exactly how that ties in, I, I think we actually have to we'll read that section, but 
I think at least um, our initial kind of uh, speculation that duration ties in this is is pretty much correct. I thought of a possible illustration of what Travis was talking about. Um, you know, he in this I didn't try to find where, but he says he's he's he do, he's not opposed to adaptation. You know, he he acknowledges that adaptation plays a role. It's just not the only role. Whereas for Darwinian evolution, it's kind of the only thing. And and so what I was thinking of is um, you know the sort of standard contemporary illustration of evolution where you had uh, dinosaurs ruling the earth. Uh, you know, I think of Jurassic Park, <laughs> dinosaurs ruling the earth, and then this big comet hits, and you know, the climate changes in a way that's unfavorable to the dinosaurs, and then that provides the opportunity for mammals to come, you know, to, to really uh, come into to power. And the mammals were already there, but they weren't, the environment was not favorable for them to develop uh, as fully. And so, and you know, apparently dinosaurs ruled the earth for a really long time. So apparently that was a pretty stable evolutionary uh, situation. And, and so I'm thinking in terms of, a, you know, so the standard view or the standard interpretation is, you know, the environment changes and then you, through natural selection, you have these random mutations in mammals, which then go on to do their thing. But maybe what Bergson would say, that would be kind of like one of those, uh, that maybe mammals at that point were kind of like one of those dead ends, uh, you know, where the crack kind of stops and the environment, the, the environment as a whole is such that, you know, I don't know, but maybe dinosaurs were the maximum carriers of uh, indeterminacy in that environment. And then the environment changes radically, very, you know, suddenly. And now the environment provides an opportunity for this other uh, type of animal to progress. And so I'm just thinking of like, maybe that's an, maybe an illustration of sort of, of uh, Travis's thing. You know, you've got a pretty, it's a pretty much a dead end in that environment, but then the environment changes. And, you know, Bergson never says anywhere that he doesn't agree with that notion that environmental changes can produce radical, you know, changes in, in forms of life. And so I'm just thinking that maybe that's an exa example of Travis's idea where you have a, a kind of dead end, something changes, and now that crack uh, moves off in a different direction. Yeah, that point just like made me think of, because um, I was thinking of like when tendencies grow, they become incompatible, right? And I was thinking of that in like one species or like one animal, one organism. Um, but that point made me think about how it applies like to, you know, larger systems, larger areas, like the whole or the organism of geography or different areas, whatever. Um, but like just the idea that the dominant tendency of say the, the dinosaurs as a dominant tendency was rendering like the tendency of mammal <laughs> uh, incompatible it so it couldn't grow it couldn't express itself because its growth would be incompatible with the dominant one overall um, so it's like the removal or the, the placing of an obstacle in front of the reptilian dominance allowed for the mammals to kind of take charge which then again will render other tendencies incompatible so like you wonder how we as humans are like rendering the the other species species incompatible to grow because we're just like dominating over them in a way trying to organize them all beneath us um, whether we should be doing that or not yeah which kind of reminds me um so i don't know exactly how accurate this is this is something i've just kind of heard is you know people wonder why exactly are humans kind of the seemingly singular species uh one thing is people believe that Homo sapiens may have basically has killed off the Neanderthals, and that there's also other hominid species, and that that we competed with over resources and things like that, and also we just simply saw them as a, a threat, and you know, kind of the big other, the 
the monster or whatnot. And because of that, we basically just kind of killed them off and it kind of gave it an impression of us being these singular organisms. But yeah, I think that goes into like his whole idea about the role of contingency in this and also how the environment as a whole and all these species in a kind of reciprocal you know, manner that they, they kind of co-determine each other to certain degrees. And I think that's pretty important. And also it kind of leads to a question of, you know, so basically the human could also be easily wiped out, um, whether through our own means, which, you know, looks increasingly likely um, or through some kind of external, just completely contingent event, like a meteor or something like that, which shows that, and then basically things would quickly change and we are suddenly no longer, uh, we're a dead end, I guess, at that point. Um, but then I guess one thing also that I'm wondering about, um, his notion of humans as a kind of, you know, into these things, is he kind of saying that, you know, by this kind of complex, you know, expression of this, this tendency that we have of kind of creating this indetermination and these complex nervous systems and all that, is that kind of, are we at a dead end necessarily? Have we, or is if we're really kind of like some kind of a, you know, a pretty, I, I'm not sure exactly what term to use, but for lack of a better one, like a special incarnation of evolution. I know that's technically wrong, but if we kind of have those tendencies, then, you know, as like a microcosm of evolution as something that's always kind of like going beyond or, and that's creative, as the, you know, the title of the book suggests, are, are humans a dead end in this sense? Or do we necessarily, because we're kind of the, this pretty interesting expression of evolution, do we necessarily have to kind of go beyond ourselves in a kind of, you know, Nietzschean Ubermensch sense that we're destined as the interesting animal to supersede ourselves? So... I wonder where that kind of maybe would tie in with like this question we have about, you know, where exactly is the role of the human in terms of like valuing evolution and progress and, and contingency and all these things, you know, it, is this basically, could this be fit into like a kind of, you know, Nietzschean like sense of like a post humanism, or is it simply that humans have kind of, pretty much like done a pretty good job of perfecting a kind of tendency and therefore we're at a kind of dead end for the moment i guess i'm not sure but yeah can i go to your earlier point very quickly uh you you talked about human beings homo sapiens killing off the others i could have sworn i saw it might have been a documentary news report where people have done dna analysis analyses and they actually think that human beings have Cro-Magnon DNA. So there was a suggestion that it wasn't so much a killing off as but as a intermarriage for lack of a better term. And uh, so it was a merging of the species rather than just uh, wholesale slaughter. Secondly, and, and please don't dismiss this, um, you know how they, we say that familiarity breeds contempt there has been more and more people studying human beings and their evolution over time. And I use that term very, very loosely, but how did we go from the stone age hunting, gathering societies all the way to the mess we're in now. And for, it seems like thousands of years, human beings have a unique, had a unique support, had a unique help that no other species had. And that was, it had another species that was helping it and it was the dog. Then when you think of hunting dogs, you know, dogs that are good at fighting, uh, protection, noise, warning, you know, 
you know, think think of the prototypical dog barking in the night. Oh, is someone trying to get through the window? I mean, and so more and more people are saying if we really wanted to understand human societal evolution, you really have to look at the critical role that the domestication of dogs played in helping humans uh, to survive. And the, th the third point is, I really was, if I could put yours and Nevin's points together, which I, I thought it was really, you know, excellent when you said, Nevit, about, you know, the meteorite hitting the earth and what looked like a dead end for the mammals. Well, it turned into a super highway, you know, and <laughs> then the mammals ruled. Um, what, what about changing the environment of human beings? What if, you know, and I, I'm not trying to get all Star Trek-y, but, but what if human beings were put on different planets, right? What if human beings were put on spacecraft for a long period of time? What if we changed uh, the, the physical environment? Because again, what I had read in the past was that the Ice Age was incredibly important to an explosion of capabilities on the part of the human race. That it seemed like, you know, the old cliche of necessity is the mother of invention. That it, it's, it's the pre-Ice Age and then the Ice Age really ratcheted up uh, human uh, attainment, human accomplishment. Uh, I, I can't help but think about kind of something I've, I've been told like a number of times about how I think like anxiety and, and mental illness and a lot of those things can come from like having a lot of time on your hands, you know, and not knowing what to do with yourself, which is funny, the connection to like duration and, and all this stuff. But I think, yeah, for, I, I think it's definitely like important to look, like you said, Ed, about the, like what species are working with us and stuff like that. I'm sure like there's so many interconnections with that, but when, it, when, uh, when Chase was talking about like what, it, are humans a dead end, kind of my conception of the problem with humans is that the specialization and the original impetus have become kind of not maybe complete opposites, but, but fairly incompatible to the point to where like, like if we're thinking of the impetus as going away from the center or like towards some direction, like maybe one of those cracks, like I said earlier, was like going backwards or something like that to where the, the specialization that has been created has been so unique and so, so distinct from everything else that that original impetus, it, it, it's still existent. It's still like in our genes and it is kind of still sleeping within us, but we have almost very little use for it. Uh, because we're not just trying to release energy. Like, that's not our goal as human beings. Uh, you know, our, our goals are much more complex, and they have much more to do with our specializations than our original tendencies. So I don't know if it transcends, but maybe it, it, it's this problem, this contradiction that exists within this, this impetus. I, I was, you know, I, when, when Chase kept saying um, the interesting animal, I was like, why does that sound so familiar? It finally occurred to me you're uh, quoting Nietzsche, I think. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I begin to wonder about that connection too. In fact, when I was reading this chapter, um, I, I, read, I, I had a seminar, or a, I had a seminar in this book at St. John's College many, many years ago. And then years later, I wrote a dissertation on Nietzsche. And that was interpretation of the will to power as a cosmological force. And reading this, my interpretation of the will to power sounds e eerily like Bergson. <laughs> and so I'm wondering if, if what happened was I thought, oh, I've got this great interpretation of Nietzsche, the will to power. And it's like, no, that was Bergson. And uh, so maybe that's what was going on there. But, um, you know, I'm wondering if some people in my committee recognize that. I don't know. But they gave me the degree anyway, so whatever. But I, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering that too, you know, that, you know, Nietzsche's concern is that uh, we are at a stasis point and that we've, you know, to use Bergson's imagery, we've, we're kind of at a dead end. And he seems to think there's a way to, as Chase was suggesting, push forward. And he does seem, you know, Nietzsche seems to think of it in sort of uh, evolutionary terms. Um, you know, if you read some of what he says in, the, in those books, Zarathustra and other places, 
because he talks about, you know, he talks about these evolutionary ideas. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting question as, you know, maybe, maybe we're, you know, maybe he thinks we have the maximum amount, you know, we can inject the maximum, a maximum amount of indetermination compared to any other living thing on this planet, but, but, but have we reached a stasis point in the sense that um, we're not creating anything genuinely new? I, I don't know. I mean, you know, we've got all these new technologies and all this kind of stuff, but I'm guessing there's people who would say those are not really creative in a fundamental profound sense. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I wonder that as well. I have no idea what Bergson would say about that, but that um, maybe, you know, it seems that I don't, and I don't know if Berg, yeah, I don't know if he ever addresses that, but it, I could imagine that even though we are the, if he thinks, even if he thinks we have the maximum power of indetermination right now, that doesn't necessarily mean we're not a dead end at this point. So go Hunter. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you mean. The one point, the one thing you said that, that I think would kind of slow my role here, because I want to respond to something that you guys were saying and what Travis said uh, using a, like, I could just quote like two whole pages straight, but I, I'm not going to do that. I'm interested in what you mean when you say that the technology is not creating anything in a profound sense. And I'd be interested to hear what, what you mean when you say creating something in a profound sense, like what, but, but first, I just like to say, I don't think that Bergson thinks that, or I mean, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is because I'm, I'm, you know, failing to remember something where he was very explicit about it or something, but, um, in, on page, on the Dover edition, on page 125, the page before the last bit of the reading. At the top of the page, he says that, uh, that uh, as a nervous activity has emerged in the protoplasmic mass in which it was almost drowned, it has had to summon around itself activities of all kinds for support. And I figure that includes the creation of a, of a light receptacle, that includes the, the development of, of limbs and organs, uh, but then while Ed was talking, I, I took it, I and this is maybe just me tripping out, getting really, you know, funky with it. But I thought, I took it as like, maybe the domestication of dogs, the domestication of animals, the, 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 the irrigation systems that allowed for the development of farming, you know, th these complexities, these structures that it summons around itself as activities of all kinds for its own support. Uh, these could only be developed on other activities, which again imply others and so on indefinitely. And thus it is that the complexity of functioning of the higher organism goes on to infinity. He's very explicit about this on page 125. He says, the study of one of these organisms therefore takes us round in a circle as if everything was a means to everything else. But the circle has a center nonetheless, and that is the system of nervous elements stretching through the sensory organs and the motor apparatus. So I think he's saying that we get more complex as a nervous system, as an organism. But I think I'm understanding what you mean in that I guess you would say that we're an end or the ner he's, he's arguing here that the nervous system is an end in some sense in that it's the center of the circle, I guess. I, 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 I'm with you there. I'm with you to that point, uh, to that extent. But then he goes on and he says that a, a more like a, the progress of the nervous system is affected both in the direction of a more precise adaptation of movements and in that of a greater latitude left to the living being to choose between them. And he's very explicit that these are, these are antagonizing points. These are completely contradicted. He says they, they appear antagonistic. Indeed, they are so. Uh, but, but then arguing that the, that the nervous system reconciles this this precision of adaptation to the environment, but then our ability to choose uh, amongst those those adapted uh, circumstances or those adapted options that we have. I can't I can't choose very well how I survive underneath seventy feet of water. I die pretty easily under those circumstances, but I can choose how I 
walk across the room or I sprint across the room. You know what I mean? Well, like, I, like, I think there's a degree of determinacy there. But, but basically, all, all I'm arguing, the point I'm getting at here is that I think that Bergson was trying to reckon, to reckon with these problems that we have here. I, I think that he was attempting to, to convey or that, like, for him, the interesting animal is not, like, the be-all, end-all of indetermination. I think he's arguing that we can get, we can evolve to become more complex. We can become much, much, much more complex. I don't know how he would feel about the argument that like, like this sort of transhumanist argument that Nevitt, you were kind of implying that like our technology is causing us to evolve or grow and be creative in some sense. Like, like we can wire ourselves a new brain or something like sci-fi. I, I don't know how he would feel about that, but I think that he's under the impression that that the nervous structure, the nervous system structure, a sensory motor structure in a subjective being is the center of complexity, but that that complexity can grow infinitely. And I don't really, now, that, now I guess that brings the question, I guess for me and for everybody, what he means by complexity? Because I don't know if complexity is necessarily what, what determines something's ability to be indeterminate, but it kind of seems as such. Because he's saying that like animals aren't very complex, but, and they don't really, or I guess not animals, like simple, like insects and things. They're not very complex and they don't, and they don't choose between things in the same way that a human does, I guess. You know what I mean? So I, I, he's, he's talking about, yes, there's a, there's a progress towards, towards indetermination. That's the only unifying concept I can find. But, but I think he's, he, he wouldn't argue that humans are like a final, end or a dead end i don't think i think he would say that the human nervous system is in no way a dead end for the growth of a complex organism that's all that's all i would have to say but what about a dead end in the context of like ending but then like breaking off you know yeah you know, like like i was saying before like a dead end is in like the chlorophyllian function but not in plants in general so a dead end in terms of maybe locomotive movement or releasing energy but not in generally like the animal as a whole, it's evolution and growth. I agree with that. I think you're going somewhere good with that. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, so like what? we might, are you kind of implying that we might see like maybe a slowing of the development of the nervous system, but let's say some other tendency in us kind of takes off that still pushes for that, that indetermination? Yeah, I so, think so. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, well, this, this all made me think of the, the Nietzsche quote of what is great in man is that he is an overcoming and not an end. And I think what's, that's a really good point about technology. So, okay, if you, okay, so one thing about complexity though. So one of the books I was reading was saying that he kind of de-emphasizes uh, saying that complexity should be like a, kind of like the standard that these things are judged by. And that I think he uses something like, uh, just like creativity instead as, as a better answer, but it kind of leaves it indeterminate itself. But it seems to me like he's saying complexity is more just like a secondary thing where it's more the movement that creates the complexity as a kind of secondary thing that you can look back at and say, you know, it's like the hand moving from point A to point B. It's a simple internal thing in terms of the movement. But then if you're going to analyze it, then that's when you see all the complexity. But he, so he talks about, you know, the nervous system is focused on like this tendency of basically movement. And because of this movement that leads to all this complexity, you have the same thing with the eye, with vision, it's basically this act of vision that is simple, but then it kind of goes along with a kind of complexity as vision kind of has these new forms to go along with it. So in terms of technology, so Marshall McLuhan, he said that technology is a kind of extension of the nervous system which doesn't mean that it's some kind of totality of 
the nervous system or the human that's just extended that we are our technology and it's uh, everything's okay. I, first of all, I hate that idea, but instead he's saying that technology is a kind of emphasis on certain aspects of the nervous system. You use the, so he talks about sensory ratios that certain technologies emphasize certain sensory ratios and certain parts of our nervous system and that that's basically the direction really that human evolution has taken that essentially the duration of our evolution has accelerated so much that it's basically left biological evolution behind so maybe you could say that that's like a relative dead end or something but basically it's almost like a it's just like a non-factor at this point because basically, you know, our nervous system and just like cultural evolution and whatnot, all these things have given us technology that is basically then in a way kind of superseded even humans to a large degree. That it's basically an autonomous force now that has basically taken like a specialization of our nervous system and then basically branched out from that to create its own kind of life form that is kind of a, I don't know what you want to call it, the, I've heard it called like, you know, one of the new kingdoms of life is basically the, the technophylum or something like that. So I think, yeah, I'm, a, I'm really kind of just particularly interested in uh, questions about, you know, the philosophy of technology and whatnot. So I see that as, as very uh, important to understanding, especially human evolution, because I think really those are the same thing now. It's basically you have the evolution of technology is basically the current evolution of humans, or at least basically this kind of uh, thing that we've given birth to, whether it's, you know, a Frankenstein or basically the star child at the end of 2001 a space odyssey or some kind of mix of those i'm not sure um but i guess we'll find out you know one uh interesting possible paradox i thought of is that you know he says uh that creativity like that uh moves into the unforeseen and so, you know, one of the essential features of uh, of true creativity is that it its its uh, manifestations are unforeseen, which then makes you wonder if if human if we can conceive of something, if it's really if that's really creativity in the sense that he he's talking about, you know, because he he talks about how how conceptualization and intellectualization reduces the, the 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 reality of continuity and of life and all that to these clear clean concepts and that reality is not that but that this conceptualization is a reduction and so if creativity involved this sort of you know intellectual activity of planning and and projecting and all of that kind of stuff would that be the kind of creativity that he would actually say is being impelled by the impetus of life? So, you know, that's an interesting question. It, it, I mean, I, went, I don't know what would create and I don't know, maybe technology would fit that category. I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not like people sat and thought uh, we're gonna, well, I don't know, maybe they did, but you know, there's things that have happened in technology that seem to have been unforeseen by anybody. Um, and, you know, the, like there was a lot of the discoveries of science have been kind of accidental. Um, and so, you know, maybe there is a kind of evolution that's moving, but it seems like to the degree that we can foresee it in a conceptual sort of way, that might be something he said, well, that's not actually creativity. Just interesting paradox. Yeah, I, I think you would see it as creativity. And, you know, it's kind of, 
it's kind of hard to judge. I, I really don't know exactly what his thinking about technology was. Um, I know he was suspicious of the of film of cinema, but that's he actually talks about it in the last chapter of this. Um, but it, so basically, his argument was that you know cinema, okay, it basically it works by it uses frames, you know, in celluloid film, and the, these are like separate, discontinuous, and by just showing them in a succession quickly enough. It shows movement. And he says basically, this is like the worst thing ever. Like this is, it's showing movement as totally spatialized and discontinuous and all this stuff. And Deleuze makes the argument that actually, Bergson, you should have been the person most able to see how that's false. That the how we actually experience film is as continuous movement. It's not. So he, he made the incorrect uh, equivocation, basically, between the technical mechanism of film and our actual experience of film. And that's where Deleuze says, actually, our experience of film is basically an extension of our nervous system and our ability to perceive movement and time. And because of this, it actually... Marshall McLuhan says the same thing that basically our technological extensions, you know, it's not just a one way causal thing. It also uh, sort of has a feedback loop that then changes us as well and, and emphasizes certain aspects of our own nervous system. So he thought that technology and, and cinema especially gave us new senses of time and of movement that was a kind of evolution of our nervous system through our extensions that that come back in these feedback loops and change us too. So I wonder, could Bergson possibly, uh, you know, agree with that or not? I'm not sure, but I, I do have this book. I can't reach it here, but um, it's called The Metaphysics of Media, and it's about Bergson that also talks about Deleuze and Marshall McLuhan. So it's basically, I think, from what I can tell, it's kind of the, the best engagement of philosophy of technology that involves Bergson, but I've only read like 15 pages of it and that was like a year ago. So I'm not sure. I guess another thing to look for in the future to this question of basically, what, what is like the future evolution of the human you know, is that through technology or is that real creativity? You know, I, I'm not exactly sure what he would say, but yeah, definitely interesting question to kind of look out for, I guess. Who did you say wrote the book uh, talking about how cinema gave us a new sense of time? Uh, Deleuze. Oh, it was Deleuze. Okay. So we're uh, 10 after, 11 after four. Any final burning comments? Oh, I have a, I have a random kind of thing to. A random comment. Uh, yeah, basically. So we are talking about, you know, manga and whatnot, and you mentioned Spirited Away. Um, I've, I found a video comparing Heidegger with the guy who made Spirited Away. It's like a 40 minute video just about this. And it was actually really interesting based on saying that this guy uses or he doesn't consciously use it, but there's incredible parallels between basically this creator of Spirited Away, this Japanese guy, and Heidegger's question concerning technology, which here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it a link down in the chat. So not- It makes me feel not quite so bad about not understanding Spirited Away if it's supposed to have any connection to Heidegger. Like, oh. That's why yeah. I <laughs> I'll, I'll admit, when I, so I saw Spirited Away just like a week or something ago, and I was also like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and uh, until I watched this video, I was like, oh, okay, I kind of see where he's going with that. Yeah, a lot of times, I mean, I love really weird films, and a lot of times I'll just watch it and be like, what the fuck did I just watch? And I'll have to watch, you know, another like, 
two hours of videos on YouTube just to make sense of it. And then I'll be like, oh, okay. Well, now I need to watch it again now that I have some understanding of what I did watch so I can watch it and actually understand it to some degree. You probably like David Lynch, I bet. Yeah, David Lynch is a very good example. Well, David Lynch is pretty special because he, he's a very intuitive filmmaker. Like he, he doesn't want to be uh, guided by like conscious ideas. So he does all this stuff kind of, he like throws in like contingent kind of like dream associations intentionally because it's a very kind of like affective rather than intellectual thing. But that's what actually what gives it a kind of intellectual depth for interpretation is because he's not using just one simple idea and leaving it to that. He's saying, you know, he's putting in like almost like dream associations and then you can interpret it, you know, in all these different ways. Yeah, I, you know, I, I watched, I mean, some of his, his films make, I mean, none of them make complete sense, but uh, some of them make more sense than others. But one, like the one that, that was really hard was, is a racer head. But yeah, <laughs> once I, I kind of settled down into, it really is like a dream, like, like not a metaphorical dream, but like a real dream. I mean, the way the end, these weird images and the transitions, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it feels very much like one of my dreams actually feels. So, you know, it's interesting that sound, like, it sounds like, it feels like, so, like I'm watching my unconscious, you know, kind of bubble up on the screen. Which is a it, yeah, um, eraser is a straight up nightmare. Yeah, yeah. A, okay, well, um, thank you again, and uh, next time. Yeah, so I put that link in the the chat if you want to if anyone wants to watch that video. Yeah, you probably want to if you do grab that before I shut things down here. Thanks, Chase. No problem. All right. Have See y'all later. Okay. I'm trying to save the chat, so that's why I'm still here. Why am I not?